Hey guys, in case you've seen the end of my very last video, you probably can remember me announcing to provide an analysis of an improvised Chacon. Well, as analyzing improvisation seems to be a very common thing among jazz musicians, I cannot recall to have seen something like this in the area of classical music, so I thought I just might give it a try. Let's go! A while ago, I stumbled upon this video uploaded by Seattle-based radio station King FM, or rather more Classical King, where you can see harpsichordist and ensemble director Alexander Weimann pulling off a beautifully opulent chacon on the Lamento. Although I will cover several excerpts, I highly recommend to listen to the whole performance, as it is an absolute highlight. Link is in the description. To get a clear orientation about the Chacon, it's good to have a general impression of its form as I will pick out individual snippets that I want to examine more closely. Mr. Weimann's improvisation encompasses a total of 23 cycles and can roughly be divided into three parts due to a certain concept of key relation. The longest phase consists of 12 cycles in D minor, then suddenly turns into D major for five cycles that culminate into a certain turning point, which leads back to six closing variations that are again in D minor. Now let's listen in for a bit. At the beginning you will recognize familiar components, but early on he's coming up with the real fancy stuff. Don't be irritated, he's using a baroque pitch tuning and if you ask me, he seems to be a bit picky about the choice of instrument in general. That's going to be the instrument for tonight there is, I just see uh, some first degree nudity. All right. So let's just better take the plain wooden one. Let's stop right here. For a listener that already has a certain background and is familiar with stylistic intricacies, at latest these four last bars clarify that Weimann can be located rather around the dolphin area of the iceberg. To be more precise, he's pretty much on the French side of the spectrum and I'm particularly speaking of the second half of the 17th century. Here's the passage once again. These voicings are very special and distinctive and I bet he didn't stumble upon those in this very performance, but check them out in previous jam sessions and just memorize them as contrapuntal sweet spots. If I may speculate a little about his concrete source of influence, here on the bottom is an excerpt from a Chacon by Louis Couperin dated around the 1660s that I find a comparable example, as it as well contains a succession of direct 9-8 suspensions. And Weimann actually can be seen as a different configuration of that exact idea. Let's listen a little bit further. From this phase on, his Chacon heavily relies on a rhythmic trope that's often referred to as Saraband rhythm, that's shimmering through most of the time and as well in passages where the right hand is striving for more melodic independence. This strategy seemingly provides a certain ongoing flow and obviously functions as a unitizing backbone structurally, but as well provides a certain guideline for the improviser himself. Whilst listening, you probably notice as well that he quickly left the realm of diatonism. Transforming the descent between the 1 and the 5 into chromatic steps is a very common procedure that can be seen in a lot of Lamento Chacons. And in the first longer D minor phase there is a total of 5 cycles where he modifies it that way. A textbook example would just look like this. The diatonic bass is being replaced whilst the upper voices apply the standard thirds and draw their 7-6 chain as usual. Here is a quick example of the sound that you can normally expect from this. Mr. 
Mr. Weimar, though, draws a much more flavorful and richer music from it. So let's check him out again. This music is very obviously drawn from that standard scaffolding, but I'd say, again, it's the juicy voicings that produce a particular dandy-ish sound. There is this very rough 6-4 chord right at the beginning when he's adjusting the 6th, and of course that four different dissonant chords of divergent types in a row, including that strange 6-5 chord even when the 7th is resolved. I wouldn't even try to make functional sense of these progressions, but rather look at these chords as a secondary but fancy stuffing within an established outer voice framework that is open for multiple chordal fillings. Sounds exotic you say? I just call this a contrapuntal concept of chord. I would even go that far to claim that this is the exact principle that works behind several of Chopin's most radical chromatic passages. And you can be sure that this piece didn't emerge from the composer's desk, but as well rather more from a keyboardist's improvisatory approach. And this leads us back to our improv. To me, this footage captures a genuine improvisatory spirit. One most obvious aspect of the performance is of course a free non-metronomical rhythmic feeling. And especially the way how he is realizing the chords in a non-simultaneous, almost random manner, which of course is a habit such a performer would apply to an outwritten composition as well, but nonetheless contributes a lot to the overall impression the listener gets. Although the piece follows a recognizable formal plan, the music differs clearly from the refinement and rigor of composed music, but in the most positive sense. The performer displays a seemingly individual type of jamming that for sure wouldn't emerge from composing with pen and paper, as it is too much drawn from a resource that could be described as haptical keyboard habits and compensational emergency devices to keep up or increase a certain rhythmic and dynamic intensity which temporarily leads to a certain abrasiveness concerning structure and sound that in an outwritten composition probably would be straightened by a rather more directed melodic and motivic approach in general. Check out the following snippet. I tried to transcribe these very last four bars where he deviates from the lamento concept more substantially. Though the tonal framework is still D minor, he's aiming for the relative major that he decorates with a lush ninth before dropping back to the original bass line. And once more the chord on the sixth includes the double suspensions. What I meant with abrasive was something like this kind of strange stuff at the beginning. You wouldn't see something like this in a composed piece, right? And I actually find this chord pretty radical, as he's putting the 6th in, what one normally does of course, but keeps playing the 5th in the left hand as well. If you look closely at the cadence, it kinda looks twisted too, with that leading tone just dropping away. Don't get me wrong here, that's exactly the amazing stuff why I chose this performance. Let's now listen to that major key section, as this is the most beautiful passage of the whole piece that as well brings in the crucial turning point.
I call turning point is the moment where he decides to break the chain of tetrachord cycles and the music culminates into a sequence that leads through the whole octave and he just keeps on going with the 7-6 chain in the left hand until he hits the 2-5-1 where he turns back into D minor. To deviate from the constituting schema is a strategy that can be witnessed in most chacons of this type. Actually in all examples I've seen this happens around the last third or quarter of the entire form. So one could speculate if this is as well a configuration of the so called divine proportion. Well I'd say it's more like an established and thus kind of preformed concept for any art that is connected to the dimension of time. As there has to be a certain arc of suspense and that graph you can see here can easily be applied not just to Weimann's improvisation but as well to the Chacon genre in general. So if the big picture of a piece like Pachelbus F minor Chacon can be seen as a mosaic put together by little refined units like in these epic baroque altar pieces, Weimann's improvisation resembles rather more a late Rembrandt where some details can be a little bit blurry but that seems to be more about the sheer intimate impression. With this being said I don't want to diminish at all the sweet melodic ideas that he comes up with and the detail that went into the lush opulent voicings and sounds that I highlighted. As I find especially these aspects the most exciting and inspiring in this all over imaginative performance. Thanks for watching the video to the very end and special big thank you to my patrons. See you next time.